Behind the Brand takes an inside look at the people that are making things happen. From up and coming entrepreneurs to the big guys, we show you how they go about their business. Meet the innovators with the know how and vision to succeed. Get behind the brand. This episode is brought to you by Veridesk. Veridesk makes office furniture simple. Seriously. Everyone probably knows their height adjustable stand up desk. I use it every day in my video production business. It was really the first step to create a happier, healthier me because I was sitting all the time, losing circulation, and standing up just feels a lot healthier. Today, Veridesk has a full line of furniture and accessories for the office or the classroom, and they make it easy to order, assemble, and change around as you need it. You really got to check them out. Just go to veridesk.com forward slash behind the brand to take a look. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to Behind the Brand. Today we're here with entrepreneur, wine enthusiast, businessman extraordinaire and author, Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. It's great to have you, man. I appreciate that. So uh, today we're talking a little bit about the thank you economy. Tell us about the book and why you wrote it. I wrote it because I think there's a huge debate about the ROI of social media. Uh, uh, I, I don't love that term, social media. I just think it's clear to everybody there's a change in the air. Um, so I just wanted to talk about business trends and something that I'm seeing as the consummate salesman, as the guy who loves ROI, who wants to close the deal. It blows my mind that I'm transforming, that the businesses I'm involved with and consulting for are looking to transform and there's a very different way to do business today. Ironically, all these new gadgets and apps and technologies are bringing us back to old small town rules and that's what I talk about in this book. I tried to focus on some case studies, you know, start to kibosh some of this that, you know, social media is just like black magic or that it's a silver bullet that's gonna save your business. I, I tried to write a practical book on a subject matter that I think has a lot of hype, a lot of overhype, and yeah. definitely some underhype, depending on which sector of the world you're at. So who'd you write it for? You know, I wrote it for probably corporate America more so than my prior book, Crush It. You know, Crush It was super entrepreneurial, like go do this, there's an opportunity. I became wine famous, internet famous, because this platform has emerged and that's the internet. It's just the maturity of the internet. This is a little bit more for, you know, you've got a business, you've got a logo, whether it's the Nike swoosh or it's your, you know, lawnmower service that has five clients. Put that logo into play, humanize it, understand one-on-one marketing is here, use the tools that are 2011 based, right. not 2005 based, and, uh, and there's some upside. And so, you know, a lot of brand managers, corporate America, agencies, I definitely thought about this, and this is a very transparent answer. I'm gonna try to give you as much good stuff because I like you and I wanna give you some juicy nuggets. I, I wrote this book thinking like I want companies to buy a thousand copies of this, yeah. right? So I definitely wrote it, you know, Crush It was like, hide this book, people are gonna quit our business. Right. This is very much like, oh crap, this is where the world's going, our people need to understand us, let's buy 45 copies for our agency or hey, let's buy 10,000 copies for all our employees. So you buy a thousand copies for the company, are you hoping that it goes top down or does it matter, just can, can kind of go out there? Yeah, as the consummate salesman, I want it I want people to read it. You know, yes, top down works, bottom up works. I mean, there's been a lot of people who are inspired by this who force the CEO to read it and so it goes bottom up, then back down. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to move product, you know, as long as you understand how you're doing it and you're not being cheesy about it, I'll come from the side, upside down, flip over, no shirt on, whatever it takes. Whatever angle I can get it to go into, that's fine by me. I think it comes down to having quality content. And it's been funny, the book just reappeared on the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. That has you know, me excited. That yeah. feels like I'm running a marathon with this book. Yeah, it's got legs. A little bit, yeah, yeah I'm excited about that. Well, that's excellent. I wanted to know more about, you know, the title is, is excellent, you know. And a lot of people have talked that customer service is the new marketing. Talk to us about what the thank you economy means though. Like, what is that? Yeah, so the word economy is a big boy word, right? I sat with it for a while. I was like, if I'm gonna use the word economy, I need to understand that people are gonna take pot shots at this. This isn't the thank you theory. Yeah. This isn't the thank you moment. Did you have some alter- alternative uh, titles? Not really. I came up with a title because I was being interviewed about Crush It post Crush It selling really well and everybody kept asking me the same thing. Like, how did this do so well? You didn't do traditional media. You know, you came out of left field. Why is this doing so well? And finally I said the thank you economy. And the host was like, huh, that's interesting. What's that? And I'm like, I'm not sure, but I like the way that just came out. Yeah. Let me think about it. And what it meant was I paid forward so much to my community. Yeah. I gave so much. I replied to tens of thousands of tweets. I replied to hundreds of thousands of emails. I put out a thousand wine shows for free yeah. every day that by the time I came out with a $25 product, I guilted 
you know, my community into buying it. Yeah, they were already sold. They were sold. Yeah. And it's because it's and they were sold the same way you're sold on what you would do for your parents or your older brother or your children. There was context there. I had built up equity, yeah. right? Uh, they were my friends. Yeah. And so I believe that that is a business pattern that is developing. So that's what I've really tried to figure out. Why did that happen for me? Does that work for corporate America? That's why I started VaynerMedia. I start, listen, client work is like getting punched in the nose. Like I'm not that interested in client work as an entrepreneur. Right. You know, I mean, this is not going to be my career. VaynerMedia is going to be an interesting step along the way and I did it because I wanted to understand corporate. You know, I knew how to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I knew how to build a small business. You know, 50, 60 million dollar business, that's a small business, right? Even though it's big for a family, it's small. I wanted to understand how billion, multi-billion dollar, hundred billion, uh, these big market cap companies worked. Yeah. I started VaynerMedia. That's what gave me the ammo to write this book because I know that the brand manager at Trident or, or, or at an agency or somebody who works on the Puma brand is gonna learn something from this and I put those pieces together and that's kind of why I did it. So let's back up just a little bit, talk about your background, how, how you got from there to here. People who are watching this, a lot of the people are small business owners, entrepreneurs. They look at you, you know, with 800,000 plus people following you on Twitter and probably, you know, millions of uh, web views on Wine Library TV. But how did you get started in all this? How did you get this job? You know, I'm an immigrant. I wasn't born here. My my dad and mom are my heroes. My mom raised me impeccably. Um, she instilled obnoxious self-esteem in me, which makes me super confident. But I come from zero place. So I think I'm balancing that ego versus the humbleness of being an immigrant. Uh, my dad taught me great things, including that, yeah. which is the biggest thing that saved me. Because as a storyteller, you know, as a marketer, there's that bullshit in me, and my dad was able to suck a lot of that out yeah. to give me the right balance. What, um, what is that? Is that the, like my my word is my bond? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean. And listen, I have so much chaos right now. I get hundreds, if not thousands of emails a day, tons of intake, and there's things that will fall through the crack. I have an assistant, I have people around me, so things will fall through the crack, but it's always how you make good, right? Yeah. And so like, I fight fiercely for having a good legacy. Well, I like that because I think that's how most of small business is still done these days. Absolutely. It's, it's done by relationship, it's done by you know, handshakes and all big that. Big business too. They just don't talk about it as much, right? The mergers, the acquisitions, the big boy stuff, yep. the big girl stuff. That happens with relationship too. Yeah, you're right. You know, I was flying down here, ironically, with a gentleman who was telling me about the stuff he's done with the government. Guy was like 70, 80 years old and telling me amazing stuff. And just, you know, it's, it's, he said, it's all about relationship. I said, you're talking to the right kid. Yeah. You know, he's trying to preach it. I'm like, boy, am I sold. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a 90 year old man in a 35 year old body. And he started laughing, we talked. Um, Absolutely, I got here because my dad built the American dream for me. You know, he built a small family business, uh, a liquor store business. I was whisked into it when I was 14. I have enormous entrepreneurial chops. I'm natural, right? Yeah. I'm like an athlete. What kind of sales was your family doing at that time? We were a three to four million dollar business at the okay. time I got involved full time. Just wine? Just wine, liquor, and beer. Okay. Shoppers discount liquors. Uh, from 98 to 2005 in that seven year window, I grew it to a 45 million dollar year business. Amazing. Um, and so I was very good. I'm good at what I do. Well, people want to know how you did that because that's. I did that traditionally. Direct mail, radio, print, you know, that big advertising. I paid myself $27,000 a year so I could hire good people. Yep. I built infrastructure and systems. I collected data. I, I did everything you have to do. It's never one move. It's not having a Twitter profile or a Facebook fan page. It's not having a LinkedIn profile. It's everything. It's yeah. everything. You've got to do everything. I just left my biggest brand that I've ever built, Wine Library TV, to start Daily Grape because I wanted the challenge of building a subscription model and a mobile play. I'm pointing to my pocket. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just think that. Um, I got here, I got there, I'm going to big places because there's a couple things I understand, which is number one, if you don't evolve, if you don't play within the reality of the marketplace, you'll get run over. That's a very strong message throughout the whole book. In Absolutely. Fact, on page 42, I kind of read this because it's, like, right. it's like one of my favorite uh, spots in the book. But there are too many businesses that are still holding back, watching the social media train rush by, convinced that if the destination is so great, another train will come along soon enough. They seem to think that it will be going more slowly and the ride will be safe and steady and they'll be able to catch up with everyone else who jumped on early. They're wrong. Though, the next train will come and it, and it does show up. It'll be going fast and full speed to some other equally exotic and unknown place. Yeah, I mean, thanks for reading that. Uh, I, I think that fast following is very interesting. Yeah. And it's a skill set. And as a matter of fact, 
I actually think it's something I would be naturally good at. I've, I've come to the realization the last six months that I'm probably not gonna start the next Facebook or Twitter, but it's very obvious to me very quickly when something's happening, and I'm always willing to go all in, and that's why I win bigger, because I don't hedge. You're an early adopter. I'm an early adopter, and more importantly, I'm an early business adopter. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of the people that were early to the social media thing were very zen. We're very journalistic. We're very, you know, I'm business. I, I, I know there's an ROI to this because I practice things very quickly and then I talk about them. You know, it's funny. I don't, I don't dream of the future. I live in the future and then just talk about it. I'm never scared. The reason I always pound my chest and why I'm so focused yeah. is because I'm living it. I've had the ROI of social media happen already. Yeah. I've been living this every day and breathing it 24-7, 365 for six years. Yeah. You know, this isn't new to me. You know, people think it's funny when I talk about Twitter or new things on stage in 2011. I was talking about this in 07, yeah. where people were like, what? You know, so I, I act very quickly. I'm an early adopter, but I try to turn it into business very quickly. Yeah. And you talk in absolutes, right? And I you're do. You're not apologetic about it. I'm that. not. It's one of the first things you say in the book. I'm just, I just think I'm right. You know, I know how obnoxious that just came off, and then people, as I just delivered that, people were like, Pfft. you know, I just think I am. I don't know what else to say. And more importantly, it's because I've already felt it. I am not Notre Dame or Yoda. Yeah. I'm not predicting. I'm doing, and then I talk about it. I just happen to be doing it so early that it's so obvious to me. Yeah. What does caring look like? You talk a lot about caring. You talk about nurturing your customers, taking good care of them. What does caring look like? What is you it know really? What the best part. You know how you just asked me that question? Yeah. It, the answer popped to me so quickly, and it feels like so right to me. Every customer knows, every person who's watching this right now knows exactly what caring looks like. I think the consumer's bullshit radar is much better than we've ever thought. It's because now they can communicate with us and tell us. You know, a Super Bowl commercial runs 10 years ago and, and a couple people like from the agency are sitting in their house yeah. and their 10 friends who are watching it with them are like, that was so funny and everybody high fives and everybody thinks it's awesome. Now you go to Twitter and everybody tells you it sucked. Yeah. There's a very different world we live in today. I think consumers know what's going on. Caring looks like to me, it's not something I see, it's something I feel. Right. And it's just very obvious to me when somebody, listen, people do nice things for you because they're trying to get the brand equity out of you for themselves. I see it every day. And then I see it when it's purely their intention for what's good for them. And then I see relationships where it's good for both. And then I see relationships that are really zen and they're just tr- trying to do it good for you. Yeah. I actually prefer the one in the middle. I'm not comfortable with somebody just doing what's good for me. Right. I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. And I'm not comfortable with the person that's just trying to suck out well, my that's brand. Pretty, that's pretty rare anyway, right? I mean, Which ones? The, the, the one that they're just trying to do something for you. It you, feels... can, you get some artistic people out there that are going there. Yeah, but... I love the middle. And I love when people don't bullshit the middle. Yeah. Like, yeah, you brought me out here and this and that, but it's good for you too, and let's, like, let's work together. I love that. I yeah. hate the people, and there's a lot of them. The leeches, they want it all for themselves. And that's big businesses. That's a small one-person entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, it's what's in it for them. Right. I mean, it's, it's very rare that I, I do business with the people that come at me like, I want to do this, and they're not hiding that there's some inherent value for them. Yeah. They don't have to make it at the forefront. I don't need somebody to come to me and say, hey, this is going to be awesome for me too. I don't really need you to do that. I think that's almost untold amongst entrepreneurs and business people. Because you get it. Because I get it. Yeah. And, and, and what I've gotten much better at is I've put higher value on that for me, and brands need to do that, businesses need to do that. The customer's not right. Don't be scared of social media because somebody says your place sucks. You go and jump in there and debate it. I mean, it's all... It's all a level playing field now, and yeah. so caring is something I think every person here feels. And, and in the book, you talk about if this were you know, the early 20th century or earlier, this wouldn't be anything new. But because we're in this digital age and, and it's becoming less personal, this caring about people one, one-to-one is kind of what, where it's coming back around to, right? How expensive would it be for you to run a commercial during Friends in the 1990s? Damn expensive. Yeah, millions. Everything's changing. I mean, people are even watching commercials. I want the people watching this right now to think if they have a DVR or TiVo and don't watch a single commercial all year. I mean, those numbers are growing. They're staggering. Um, the world is changing. This is, this is the biggest culture shift we've ever lived through. And it's not social media. It's the internet. Right. The consumer internet, the one that started in 95, I don't want some nerd saying, actually, Gary, it's 1950. I know. I'm yeah. talking about when people started using it. Yeah. When AOL spammed our actual mailboxes. That thing is a baby. That is a 17-year-old product. It's five minutes in, in the scheme of business. Yep. It's revolutionizing everything, and the at-bats that every business now has costs less, it costs sweat equity, it's tough to scale, the value's in the humans, 
but it's a culture shift, a big one, and it's leveling the opportunity for different businesses to do different things, and the companies that understand it will survive and win, and the ones that don't will lose. Plenty of businesses went out of business when the television age came. Yeah. Plenty of businesses went out of business when the video game market came, and look at the soap opera industry, going out of business, why? Farmville. Women are playing games on Facebook instead of watching one days of our lives. And so, I just think that I'm stunned um, that people don't recognize how obnoxiously big this all is. Yeah. I mean, and it's gonna be, I mean, I can't wait to watch this in five years and be like, see? Because in five <laughs> years from today, the world's gonna look totally different. No YouTube, no Facebook, no Twitter seven years ago. So Gary, who's doing it well? What brands are doing a good job with the thank you economy or social media in general? This is tough, right? Because this is where I think I'm doing a really bad job. I know our clients are doing it well and that's like the cheesy answer. I'm not spending a lot of time paying attention to other people. I think some people may view that as a strong weakness. I view it as a strong strength. I, I just, and there's probably, the right answer is probably a little bit in between. I'm probably doing a little less paying attention to competitors and other brands than I should be. So this question's tough. I, I hate that I'm probably not answering it as well as I could. Well, let me but that's the this truth. Way. Yeah, well, you were a little bit critical of the Old Spice campaign, right? It was, right? because the Old Spice campaign was a social media campaign which doesn't exist. They did this hoopla, a lot of people know what happened, you know, they took the guy from the commercials, they amassed a lot of people, got a lot of followers, did YouTube videos, did one-on-one marketing, they did a, listen, if you read it carefully, I give them a lot of credit yeah. up to the last point, which So that's is, what they did right. They did almost everything right. Okay. They created context in the character, they made it one-on-one, they link-baited Kevin Rose and Alyssa Milano, they went into, into Reddit, they did almost everything right until the big money shot which is that they let that community sit there and they left them. Yeah. They left the community and so I think that that was a huge mistake. Um, I think that, you know, and what to people that didn't see it, they amassed tens of thousands of Twitter followers and then at replied one of them in the course of six months because they just wanted to amass them. They looked at it as data collection. They looked at it as an email newsletter. Yeah. This little collection versus connection thing. That's a very nice one. I haven't heard that, believe it or not, that often. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what happened. It's, it's the one night stand versus marrying somebody. They one night stand their customers. I think you need to marry your customers because I think we're all going to map, and this is, in, this is it. Anybody watching this video, this is the moment you've been waiting for. This is the only thing you need to take away. We are going to map through UI and UX through ad platforms, through A-B testing, we are going to map customer acquisition. Awesome. Face- the holy grail. Facebook and, and technology is gonna help us map. Why do you think Farmville and Groupon and Guilt Group do what they do? We will map customer acquisition, the battlefield going forward for all of us. Production companies, wine guys, business peeps, is going to be retention, lifetime value. And the only way you do that is by giving a crap and being human. <laughs> the businesses that understand how to get there in a scalable way, whether they're a good trillion dollars or nine dollars, are going to be the ones that are relevant going forward. I like that. A lot of the people who are watching want to know, sort of want to break this down probably and understand, you know, you say that the, the Old Spice campaign was great in many ways, but they fell short. They fell short because they didn't respond or engage their people. They were just collecting. Now, I, I think on the Old Spice campaign side, the brand managers might say, oh, we sold a ton of product. We did great. Our ROI was you know, through the roof, better than expectations. They were on coupon during that time. Yep. So the debate of, you know, of what really helped move the product is there. But they did do well. They got me to buy a, a, a stick of Old Spice deodorant. I did. I went to CBS. I saw it. I was like, oh. It kind of all resonated. Yep. You know, this is branding, right? Impressions, emotion. Awareness, I bought yeah. it. But then, and not a lot of people are gonna do this and they're not worried about my business, because they handled it so poorly, now I don't buy it. And they've lost my business forever. So they did more damage than they did good. I think it's a very interesting debate. What I know is this. They, I don't believe they created any lifetime value. And I don't understand how to go forward without lifetime value. So then what's the, what's the lesson here for small business owners and entrepreneurs? That when you invite 80,000 people into your universe and you got them there because they're excited, you don't just never talk to them again. And that's just, everybody understands that. A new restaurant that opens, you don't run a bunch of ads in town, everybody gets pumped, you got a big time chef, everybody shows up and there's no employees or anybody talking to them. Yeah. They didn't follow through. They didn't follow through. You know, if every woman out there knows exactly what I'm talking about. You had a great date, 
it went awesome and he didn't call. Yeah. How does that feel? Like crap. That's how those customers felt. There was no engagement, no relationship. And in a world now that we live in, which is based on word of mouth, we're based on word of mouth. Because that's what Facebook and Twitter are bringing to the table. It's bringing word of mouth on steroids. Where context is being created. I like this pizzeria. I hate this burger. I like this airline. I hate this hotel. These impressions are being thrown at us from our friends. And being indexed, by the way. Right? Absolutely. Yep. But more importantly, when your aunt says that this place is delicious instead of an advertisement, it matters more because you have a relationship with your aunt. That endorsement matters more. Yeah. And these things are happening the way we do business is changing. It's gonna be a lot less of talking and a whole lot more of listening. That's a culture shift from the way we've done business for the last 150 years and there's a lot of pain in changing into that game. It's kind of like businesses have been playing basketball for the last 200 years and all of a sudden we said, you know what? It's now about hockey. Some people aren't gonna translate. Let's talk about the TechCrunch interview. A lot of the book talks about taking care of customers and that the people who care about the customers most will win. And then another part or a majority of the book talks, I feel a lot like it's con- trying to convince uh, people about the validity of social media and how to use it. You talk a lot about listening. Uh, so in the TechCrunch interview, you sort of jabbed a lot of the social media marketers out there, whether they're on the brand side or the consulting <laughs> side or whatnot, you call them clowns and you yeah. got a lot, of, a lot of flack for that. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I mean, I think that uh, I'm very comfortable in talking about what I believe um, because I have a good track record within myself. I could be wrong. Let me phrase I, it this way. Let me please, it go this ahead. Way. So, so on the one hand, you're, the, the book is all about trying to convince the masses to try and adopt social That's media. That's where it's funny. My DNA is very rah-rah, yeah. so it's gonna come across as convincing. I actually don't give a crap about convincing anybody about <laughs> anything. Actually, the fewer people that understand how to do this, the yeah. better for me, right? Yeah. So, I'm just passionate, right? And I'm definitely rah-rah and motivational and let's go get them team, we're gonna beat the crap out of people. You know, I like that. You're I competitive. Love, I'm super competitive. Okay. So when I talk, it comes out that way. Ironically, I really don't care. And that may sound crass and not awesome. I just, I just don't because I know that rah-rah is not enough. I hate theory. I hate rah-rah. I hate ideas. I love execution. Yeah. So maybe you. And so that's my problem with social media experts yeah. and gurus, right? Like I need to know how you've executed. Like I think it matters that Crush It sold really well in a world of a lot of experts and big brands like me right. that didn't sell well. That mattered. That means there was ROI. I think it matters that I sell a lot more wine because people became obsessed with me and come to my store and buy my wine. I think that matters. I think business matters. And I think the conversation got a little bit too far left, right? I like gray. I don't like black and white. In 07, it was black and white. Social media has no ROI, it sucks, right? All of a sudden, there's this huge bubble in 2011 going into 2012. Social media is awesome, but all the people that are talking and the people that, companies are hiring 22 year olds because they're 22. Let me tell you something, companies. Your 22 year old did not use Facebook the last three years to do business. They did it to look, look at chicks bikini pictures. Like so, you know, there's a very huge disconnect in this new emerging thing TechCrunch is a big platform. I didn't mean a whole lot by it. I kind of was just talking the way I was talking. They were smart, used it as the title of the blog post. Yeah. They knew how to link bait. Um, I felt compelled that I needed to expand on it. Um, but I don't want to support and rah-rah people that I think are fakers. A lot of people are like, Gary, you're hurting the industry. I'm not hurting the industry. I'm dramatically helping the industry. You're calling it how it is. I'm, I'm trying to create a conversation over something that needs to be talked about, which is that the guy who's the SEO expert and the guy who's the e-commerce expert, and the, you know, what have you done? Like, have you ever tangibly converted something into a real sale? If you did that, I'm interested, and now how big of a variation of that is going to evaluate the way I kind of look at it. Yeah. Um, but if you've just been talking, I'll be honest with you, I'm now, finishing my tour on Thank You Economy. This is one of the last events I'm doing for quite a long time. I feel like I need to shut up and go do again. If I want to be relevant in 2015, I need to go do. I need to get some dirt under these fingernails. Not be pampered and get flown out and do events. I need to go get raw again because that is the only way I'm going to be um, good, the only way I'm going to be relevant. It's the way I look at push-ups. Yeah. You can't read about push-ups. <laughs> Clearly, I read about push-ups. Yeah. But if you've got big guns, you're doing the push-ups. Yeah. In social media right now, there are way too many people reading about push-ups. I just got this image of Rocky III after Rocky loses the fight. You're going back, yeah, going back, back to back. your roots. He got, you're right. Rocky III is a great example. Mr. T beat his ass. Yeah. 
And I feel like um, there's just a lot of people who are claiming to know what they're talking about, who are regurgitating stuff they've read from other blogs or books, yeah. and it's one big circle jerk, and that's not a good thing, and that's bad for business. People who run their own business struggle a lot with personal, you know, family stuff and work stuff. How do you balance? One of your like positioning statements, the first things I read about you is family first, yeah. then da 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 da. How do you do it? I'm so desperate to not be full of shit, right? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You'll have to beep it. Um, because I don't think I'm executing as well as I could in that. Right this moment as we're taping this, um, I'm doing way better. I can't believe how little work I'm doing on the weekends. So that's been a big boost in the right direction. I have a two-year-old daughter, Misha, now, and that's definitely, and, and it, you know what's so funny? The daughter is like maybe even an excuse. I miss my wife, so like even that. Like so I'm doing better. How? Because I'm very in tune with my emotions and I always play the same card, which is you bought the Jets, right? Which is a business goal of mine. Uh, not a jet, I'm talking about the New York Jets. Right. You've bought the Jets, you're widely considered one of the great businessmen of all time, great, awesome. You get a phone call and your mom is dead. How do you feel? And I play that gut check with myself a lot. And I'm never happy. I'm not ever happy if I don't even go that extreme. Like if I miss this or this person got hurt. or It's very obvious to me what life's about. I spend an enormous amount of time hanging out with like 80 and 90 year old people. I'm obsessed with it. I think I'm an old soul. Um, and I... Uh, I really, really, really know like what life's about. It's not about how much money you make. It's about you know the experiences and friends and family. I'm not very good at executing my own philosophy right now. I've gotten dramatically better in the last two years. Um, I have an amazing partner in crime, Lizzie. My wife is super independent. You know, it's so funny. I grew up thinking I wanted a girl who was obsessed with me, and my, I was her life. It was shocking to me that what I wanted was the complete opposite. I mean, Lizzie loves me, and we, we're, we're madly in love, but she's an independent girl. She yeah. doesn't need me around every minute, and that is huge. Is she involved in your business? No, as a matter of fact, the poor girl, she's so awesome. She wants me to tell her things that I don't want to. It's such an escape for me when I'm home. I don't want to talk about it. I'm so on. There's so many, I mean, you can't even comprehend how many things I'm thinking right now about yeah. as we're doing this interview. Yeah. Like literally three to four pretty important things. It's, you know, I'm exhausted yeah. by doing all that stuff. So when I'm home, I want it to be about like, what did Misha do today? What is, what's going on with the family? Like, I think I that's that great escape. advice. That's great advice because you know, I think a lot of uh, small business owners will take the business right home with them. My dad did and I could see where that wasn't good. Yeah. And not that he talked to my mom about it and not that he brought it home, he brought the baggage home. Yeah. I'm really good at like checking it at the door at some level. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm, I'm obnoxiously positive, yeah. so I never tell anybody the problems. I love being the last line of defense. Is she the realist then in your family? I think we both are. Yeah. I think we both are. I think we're, we're very similar, Lizzie and I. You know, it's why I probably love her so much. I love myself so much. You know, I, you know we're similar, you know? Let's talk about the CNN interview you had this last week with Pierce Morgan. <laughs> uh, yep. Interesting in many ways. Uh, <laughs> I like, how, I like how you're bringing up my lowlights, like the TechCrunch interview, the CNN interview. Well, I watched both of them, and uh, I mean, I have my own opinions about yep. it, but like, uh, are TV people snobs, you think? Are TV people snobs? Yeah. I mean, I thought. TV personalities or people behind the cameras and the I producers thought, and things of that nature? I thought Piers was rude, to you specifically. Well, Piers knows me. I did an interview. What you don't know is that I did a full pledged 20 minute interview about Thank You Economy with Piers, and then. The world exploded, right? Tokyo and all this, and it still to this date has not aired. Okay. So we had a lot of con. We really hit it off, actually. Okay. He was rude to me because Pierce is successful. I, you know, you know when you can see your own. Yeah. You know, I, I think Pierce. Not that he's concerned about me, but I think he sees a little bit. And, and listen, Pierce is widely looked upon as a little pompous too, and all this. Yeah. Um, listen, I can, I knew I had one minute. I came with straight thunder in that interview. I'm sitting with the founders of Twitter. He makes the comment that, you know, you're acting like you invented it. Yeah. I don't care who invents it. Who gives a shit who invented baseball? Everybody cares about Babe Ruth. Well, that I don't invent things. I just know how to use them better. Right. That sort of annoyed me. But the other thing that kind of bugged me was that um, the, your Twitter buddies didn't come to your rescue and say... I thought they did. Yep. I think if you rewatch that, if you look at Biz, when he goes to Biz and says, do you think Gary's right? He kind of said yes. I mean, listen, here's the awesome part. Yeah. I actually don't care who agrees or disagrees with me. I am obsessed with being on the right side of history. I'm obsessed that what we're doing right now, here's what I know. We're doing this interview. My great, great, 
great, great grandchildren are watching this right now. Hi, Jeremiah. You know, <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Yeah. I want them to look back at their you know, great, great, great grandfather and say, he was smart, he was right. Oh, can't believe he said that and it happened 100 years later. Like, I'm obsessed with being on the right side of history and I just never care about the moment. I care about where things are going. What's, I, I don't care about right this minute. We were talking before, right, about business. I was like, yeah, yeah it's never now. Tell me about 24 months from now, because if you're right about what's going on in 24 months from now, you have a really good chance of being okay. And I, I play that game, and so, actually, you know, I, you know what's so awesome? I, appreci- I feel like you're like defending me. You're like, I, I appreciate the energy. I was not miffed by Pierce. I thought it was fine. I liked it. I thought it was a good zing and a good joke. Yeah. I thought Biz did kind of back me up. And most importantly, um, look at the first thing I said. I said Martha Stewart made me throw up in the green room. So I wasn't being super polite. I went on national television and told everybody that Martha made me throw up, right? I think most people would be okay with that. Fair, but you know there's millions of Martha fans and Martha's been very successful. I, I just have very strong opinions. I'm not scared to back them up. Most of all, I really appreciate the banter and people who disagree with me, especially if they're respectful. Yeah. You know, and I don't mind if they zing and zang because I zing and zang. What's good for me goose is good for the gander, right? right. I'm, uh, I'm okay. All right, fair enough. Yeah. So we looked a little bit forward. We looked yep. to your great great grandchildren. Yes. Is that right? Looking back a little bit, okay. know, history tends to repeat itself. Sure. Who are some of the people that you admire? Some of these, and beyond maybe your, your immediate family, who are some of these entrepreneurs, other people that inspire you? Or is there anyone? I'm not that inspired by anybody I don't know. First of all, history has a good, uh, especially pre all this documentation, history has an interesting way of rewriting itself. Right? I call it the Christopher Columbus rule. I think you know, you look back at some of the things he did, it can be kind of looked upon differently, yeah. right? Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant. My parents are so my heroes, so my heroes, right? And I don't agree with 99% of the things my dad thinks in business. I really don't. So march to the beat of your own drum, do your own thing and... But you know, there's, certain, there's a certain vibe that I respect. You know who I respect? Vince McMahon. That's okay. a weird guy to respect. I don't know everything about Vince McMahon. He might do a lot of shady things yeah. that would make me embarrassed about saying that. You wrote about him in the book. You know what I like about him? And you know what I like about the notorious B.I.G., Biggie Smalls? I'm obsessed with storytellers. Whether Vince is the guy who does that or he has some amazing writers from within, I love storytelling. I think the WWF has built a billion dollar industry on storytelling. It's men's soap opera. Yeah. I'm impressed by that. I'm impressed by rappers who paint very distinct pictures to me. I don't know why rap has stuck to me more than other songwriters. I like their struggle. I'm demoing, but you know, especially the first generation uh, you know, that came through, a lot of struggling. I love hip hop artists who sold tapes out of the back of their trunk. That yeah. speaks to me. Yeah. I like raw, I like dirty. I'm always gonna take 50 cent over a Harvard grad. Yeah. And so, uh, that's what's You're the champion of the little guy. You're At the- some level, but I love the big guy too. You know, it's so funny. I, you know what I'm the champion of? The gray zone. It's not black and white. It's not just Zucks and Gates and all these Jack Welsh and it's not just 50 and Jay-Z and you know, immigrants that came from nothing. It, it's all gray, right? Mm. I like gray. I hate when people, as a guy who talks in absolutes, it's funny how much I hate them. <laughs> what mistakes have you made? Most of them. Look, give, give me some examples and you know, I think everything I'm doing is a mistake. I, I think becoming a personal brand is a mistake. Well, I'm not scalable. Well the reason I ask that is because uh-huh. you know, I think a roadblock for a lot of these entrepreneurs who are trying to do their thing is they're afraid to make mistakes. Yeah. They're afraid I love to mistakes. fail. I'm obsessed with mistakes. And there's a stigma, right? Especially in corporate America, everyone wants yeah. to blame you. Well, that's a different story. I'm not in corporate America, I'm an entrepreneur. Vayner Media is a mistake. And you want a better answer? I knew it was a mistake before I started it. Why is it a mistake? Because it's not scalable, right? It's client work. It's a step backwards for a progressive entrepreneur. There's a lot of things wrong with it, but I knew why I was doing it. I did not understand corporate America. I could read a million books and it would have never done it for me. I needed to go in there and taste it, back to the dirt under my fingernails, and here I am two years later and I have a fairly solid grasp. Do I know everything? Of course not. But I have enough flavor in my mouth right now to know what to do because I'm not in business to be successful tomorrow. I want to be very relevant 40 years from now. When I'm 75, I want to be gangster. I want 20 year old entrepreneurs to be like, that is the guy. The marathon. Absolutely, and so I needed that tool, that knowledge in my belt, so I took a two year, three year, whatever this run is gonna be, sabbatical, right? And learned what I had to learn. I'm obsessed with mistakes. I do do so many things wrong, I mean, uh, I, I screwed up Obsessed TV when I tried to scale multiple personalities. Samantha's amazing. That was me screwing up too. I'm always thinking I could do so many things. I screw up every day because I'm trying to juggle too many balls. 
I need to focus and I know it, yeah. but I can't help it. It makes me happy to juggle. How about Wine Library TV? Because you were not an overnight success. You were no. putting out videos for how long until it got traction? Probably a year and a half. So how do you know, I mean, I think a lot of people want to know this. How do you know like when to quit, when to keep going? What I am is not scalable. Nothing I say is going to help anybody who's watching right now. It may motivate somebody. It may be a kick in the pants. But I think the principles, I mean, there's something the to be learned. The principles are right. There. Here are the principles. You know why I'm sitting here right now? Because I outworked you. Zoom in. I outworked you. I worked harder. I, I had a certain skill set. Everybody has one. And I just worked harder. The guys in the NBA, do you know how many guys have the skill sets of LeBron and Kobe? A lot more than people think. But those guys worked harder yeah. and they went all in. Let me guess, LeBron and Kobe didn't dominate school. Though I heard Kobe was pretty okay, but they didn't dominate. You know why? Because instead of si- studying some bullcrap Saturn geometry stuff at 5.30, like everybody else who's trying to balance when our society tells you to work on your weaknesses, yep. right? They were outside shooting free throws. When I was 15 and I sat in German class and I got all Fs, F, 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 final F. When I did that, the reason I did that is because I was sitting in that class thinking about how I was gonna sell baseball cards or reading the Beckett baseball card guide, or a couple years later, reading the Wine Spectator. You know why? Because I went all in. Everybody out there right now is half pregnant. They're all hedging. You know, and I'm just not that kind of character. I go all in, I'll win big, I'll lose big, and most of all, I've recognized what I'm good at. And I've always been good at making money. And now as I've matured and I, I've just become a better person. Yeah. You know, I do less bullshit. I've, I've done more. I, you just get better. I'm just very aware of who I am. I think, right, I think most people lie to themselves because they're disappointed in what they're not instead of being happy with what they are. Oh, I like that one. I've never said that before. And that's what I think is happening. Like, shit, I wish I was the quarterback of the New York Jets, but I'm not. You know, and so in sixth grade when I realized, wait a minute, I'm more likely to buy the Jets than to play for them, that's where I went. I didn't go try out for the football team. I tried to figure out how to sell things to the guys on the football team. So is 2011 then a great time to go all in? Yes, 2011, 2009, 2004, 2013, 2097. So it has nothing to do with the economy, it has nothing to do with... Bad economies are awesome. The best players win more. Yeah. I love bad economies. That's when I create more market share. When I, I, love I, wish, I wish shit hit the fan. I wish the Great Depression came tomorrow. And that sounds insane and I don't because ultimately I don't want a lot of people to suffer. But for me, if I was very selfish, awesome. Because I feel very comfortable in that environment. Because that becomes alpha nature, best people win and I'm just confident. What's something about you that your viewers don't know, that we don't know? You have a superpower, do you have something that... I sleep uh, a lot more than people think. That's something people don't know. You know, I say on Twitter 10 times a day, do you ever sleep? I think I'm just so awake when I'm awake that it gives a perception that I'm always awake. Yeah. I'm exhausted at the end of the day. I need a lot of sleep. I'm big on six, seven hours, no problem. I'm not one of these four hour guys, you know? I wish I was. I get pissed when I hear things like Rupert Murdoch sleeps four hours and it works out. I'm like, crap, he's got a couple more hours on me. But again, back to knowing yourself. At this point, maybe because I'm not doing the right things exercise wise, I do feel like when I was in an exercise, I was a little bit you know, less sleep needed. So I'm thinking about those kind of things, rounding out my game right now. I've got this entrepreneurial, I'm gonna out hustle you. I've got more natural entrepreneurial spirit thing. I've got that figured out. What I need to do now that I'm hitting this 35 year old range, this is where I need to be very conscious. This is where the fork's in the road. And there's a lot of forks, right? But this is new fork for me is, hey, get your stuff right, right? L- take a couple more vacations. Enjoy life a little bit. Start working out eat better. I need to really start positioning myself for real success because the stuff that I have comes natural to me. I don't need to work on my entrepreneurial skills. Um, I need to work on some of the secondary things around me. I think that's a great message too. You you need to be well-rounded or else other stuff starts to suffer, right? No question, including relationships and family. Absolutely. I also think, and I hope people are getting this, and this is the energy I'm trying to give in this interview, focus on your strengths. Like, Tiger Woods just tried to work on his swing. Clearly not on how he handles his relationships. You know, like, work on your strengths. It is the biggest misplay. It is the, I'm dying to figure out who's, in whose inherent value is it that America brands work on your weaknesses. Because that's what we do. You turn on television, we are sold to work on our weaknesses. I am just very counterculture against that. I don't believe in that. I disagree completely. Work on your strengths. What are you good at? Do that. No matter what it is, do it. So what's next? I have no idea. 
I'm very reactionary, uh, which may be a weakness. I've been starting to debate if that is a weakness of mine. Here's what I know. I've spent a good amount of time in the last five plus years building my brand, creating a network that I can leverage and that has brought me enormous opportunity. I think there's something to be said for me to go back and operate and focus on one thing. So I will tell you that I would be somewhat disappointed that if in a year from now I'm not as focused on one thing as I've been in a long time. Because right now, you look, I'm promoting Thank You Economy, right? Um, I've got VaynerMedia. I'm still involved with Wine Library. I've got a new project called Daily Grape, right? I'm an angel investing. I'm doing a lot of things I'm starting to wonder all these things I've learned the last five years by being entrepreneurially free. Um, what would happen if I went back to really operating, which is something I want to do. I think it separates me, and I want that to continue to separate me. So my energy is, hey, go do one thing really, really well. Keep five, ten percent out here to keep yourself sane. Yeah. But can I go ninety-five percent all in on something? Because my gut feeling is, it will be, it will be my biggest victory yet. Are you a good boss? I mean, you have you talk a little bit about the company culture and the way you know you let people take vacations or whatnot. I think I'm a great boss. I may be a hair too soft. You too know? soft? Too soft. In what way? I think, I'm, uh, I think I put too much on my own shoulders even though I'm not a micromanager. Um, and so what that means is I always count on myself at some level. Um, and we've hired some really good people at VaynerMedia and I'm seeing that. I'm like, hmm, good people, really, really good people do matter, right? Um, I think that uh, I'm soft. I, you know, I talk a good game, right? I get here and I get all angry and I'm throwing up gang signs. But I really care about people so I struggle. You know, I, I fire fast but I'll never do the firing, right? You know, like, and I don't think that's right sometimes. Like, I don't love yeah. that about me but it's the right thing for the business. So do you think, I mean, are you gonna put someone in, in your place to do that sort of management stuff? Is and there I someone do that. like that? I do that. Brandon do, and my team does that at, at Wine Library. AJ does that at VaynerMedia with Matt and Marcus and other people. I'm great at building out management teams. It's something I'm very good at. Yeah. But it goes back to your strengths. You know, you're, maybe you feel like you're too soft so you're delegated to someone Absolutely. else. I just don't like to see somebody's face when you're letting them down, right? I hate that. It's why I'm such a big engager, right? I don't want to let people down. Um, I put a lot on my shoulders, but it's, it's my strength. You know, your gift is your curse, you know?